Okay, well, um, it's just about a minute after seven, and um, hopefully um, everybody is set up and ready to go. Uh, my name is Claire Jantz. I am a professor in the Geography Earth Science Department, and I'm also the director for the Center for Land Use and Sustainability. And I'm really pleased to welcome everybody to the uh, Cumberland Valley Esteem Career Panel. Um, this evening's focus is going to be on earth science and the geosciences, and we have a really um, spectacular um, group of professionals who are going to be sharing their stories with you. Um, and uh, so I don't want to take too much time away from them, but we'll first be hearing from Dr. Verbos, who is a project manager at the National Park Service. Ashley Mingle, who is a GIS analyst at Gannett Fleming. Samantha Weiger, who is just starting the graduate program at Johns Hopkins University. And Caitlin Lucas, who is the Community Clean Water Action Plan Coordinator at the Franklin County Conservation District. So welcome everyone, welcome to our panelists. And um, Rose, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for the great introduction and welcome everyone. I feel pretty honored to be the first among some incredible female professionals in the field. So thank you for that great honor. And I'm looking forward to learning more about everyone's profession. As Dr. Jantz introduced me, my name is Rose Verbis. I have a PhD as a social scientist. I'll tell you where my STEM degree comes in in just a moment. And there is just a little bit of feedback there it goes. Perfect. So I work as a project manager for the Denver Service Center at the National Park Service. You can see on your screen there just a couple of screenshots of the location. I am located in Denver, Colorado in Lakewood is where my office is. So you can see the dark green there is that we're just right along the front range of the Rocky Mountains, a pretty cool location for us to be. The office that I work for is a centralized office that provides planning services for the whole agency. So I work on projects across the US for the National Park Service. The really cool thing about the work that I get to do is that I have the opportunity to share best practices, shared experiences from other parks and projects that I'm working on and really help the park interdisciplinary teams do planning. And I work on interdisciplinary teams too. So we're gonna to hear tonight from a bunch of professionals. And I also get to work with landscape architects, natural and cultural resource specialists, visitor use and socio-econ specialists on a variety of project planning types, anywhere from visitor use management plans, resource stewardship strategies, doing river planning, you name it, development concept plans, we're working on those kinds of projects. So on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about who I am and my background. So this slide just makes me happy. You can see all the smiles. You can see the puppy loves of my life in these photos. My husband's made an appearance as well. So here's a bit about who I am. I'm from central Pennsylvania. Originally, I grew up in Dillsburg. Many of you may know where that is located. I have a math undergraduate degree from Messiah College. As you might have noticed in the work that I currently do, I have graduate degrees in the social sciences, but both of those graduate degrees, my master's and my PhD, had really big focuses on statistics. And I'll talk a little bit about how I use that in the work that I do and how that position and that degree has really served me well in my work. So some of these photos, just to tell you more about who I am, because behind our professions, we're all just people hanging out, living life together. You can see in the top left was our pup, Jake. We had to say goodbye to him last summer, very unfortunately. And then we welcomed our new puppy, Blue, who is currently standing outside of my office door crying because we would normally be playing fetch right now. But I'm excited to be here with you all on this career panel. The next photo working our way over, in addition to the work that I do for the National Park Service, I get to serve and work on international projects. That, pro that photo is from a project that I worked on in Brazil, helping to do public use and visitor planning and conservation areas in Brazil, and also helping them understand their research and data needs. In the lower left is the photo um, 
prior to and in between my graduate degrees, I had the opportunity to lead outdoor trips. And this was from a program that I started at a college in Georgia. You can see that is the beginning or the terminus, depending on which way you hike the Appalachian Trail. And we took 12, 15 college students and did a week and a half long trip hiking and backpacking on the Appalachian Trail. So the focus um, of this slide is that I've worked really hard. I have an incredible career that I'm really passionate about. I have a lot of energy about active living and the work that I do, but um, behind all of that is just some fun that's going on too. That was a perfect transition, Claire. I was ready to go to the next slide, so thank you. I mentioned that I'm a project manager and I work on interdisciplinary teams on projects across the US. So here's some photos that represent a range of those projects. In the upper right hand corner is a photo from a project that I'm working on in Alaska at Katmai National Park and Preserve. There's not a photo of the work that we're doing at the Everglades, but I'm working on a project at the Everglades. You can see in the upper and lower left, photos from Gateway National Recreation Area. You might recognize the backdrop is New York City. Gateway is a national park unit that has a beach that is accessed from a bus out of Brooklyn in New York, so pretty cool. And I know there's not a, the chat, or well maybe there is, there's not maybe chat available for all the participants, but just a question to think about is, did you know that the National Mall in DC the Liberty Bell, which is a part of Independence National Historical Hall in Philadelphia, and the Statue of Liberty are all managed by the National Park Service, including Gettysburg Battlefield. So many of you may have visited some of those sites. So just think about one of your favorite National Parks, Park experiences, and I've been a part of helping develop those experiences at other parks. Next slide. In addition to the work that I do internal to the agency, I also work on an interagency council. And that interagency council is composed of the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and NOAA. And the importance of this is that so much of the work that we do is important to be able to communicate across agencies. So many agencies and companies can become really siloed in the work that they do, and this consistent planning framework really helps us to speak across those lines. Next slide. All right, so that's what I do, and what does this have to do with having a math degree, this career panel, and STEM? So you can see on this slide that planning is all about communicating, implementing, identifying who we can help and training and development. And a huge piece that underlies all of that is the ability for us to understand our visitor needs through surveys and data collection. Part of the work that I do is to help develop scopes of service for visitor surveys, such as, you know, what are your expectations when you go to a park unit? What kind of facilities do you want? What kind of experiences are you expecting to have? Do you go with your family? Do you go by yourself? Do you want to experience solitude or are you looking for a more social experience? Answers to all of those questions can be qualitative or quantitative and analyzed to help inform some of the decisions that parks are making daily and in their plans about how to manage those visitor experiences. Next slide. And here's some of the issues and questions that that visitor data can really help. And so my degree in math and then my social science degrees as a master's student and a PhD student have helped me to be able to understand, interpret, and analyze that data to really, in the really applied sense of helping make decisions from that. We ask questions like, what would you like to see the park continue doing or expand upon? We're interested in improving those experiences breaking down barriers for access, a big topic of conversation right now in the agency, and I would probably say across the US right now, is considering equitable and inclusive access, especially to our parks and public lands. The teams I work on are also interested in new and emerging visitor uses and community needs, and then also considering the business opportunities. So I mentioned that I sit on the visitor use management and socio-econ team. We are interested in commercial services and understanding supporting local businesses, developing new business opportunities, safety, and a sense of place, all issues and opportunities that can be considered. Next slide. 
Some of the types of data that we look for. So this is where we're taking this data, collecting it and you interpreting it to inform some decision making are the seasonality and timing of visitor use. Think about the last time you went to a park or an open space. What time of the year was it? What time of the day was it? Was your activity associated with your seasonality and the timing of your visit? The type of experience that you have. Did you visit for a day? Did you go overnight? Did you stay in a hotel or camp? All those kinds of questions. Associated with the visitor use often comes impacts to the resources. And part of the mission of the National Park Service is to protect and preserve those resources for the enjoyment of future generations. So a huge part of what we do is to constantly compare the impacts that visitors could be causing to natural and cultural resources and the experiences that we're trying to provide and it's the balance. Accessibility is a big piece of consideration. Impacts to visitor services, experiences, communities, some of those pieces are really important. And then with anything, we are a federal agency, we do have budget constraints, so we consider those in our planning processes as well. So next and final slide. So while we take questions, just to sum it up, part of what I would say has been a huge contributor to the success that I've had as a project manager has been my degree in math and the ability to help collect information that can inform that uh, those decision-making processes. Um, thank you very much, Rose. And I am sorry for um, uh, being click happy with the uh, slide advances. And I hope that didn't disrupt anyone's experience too much, but that was a really thought provoking um, kind of behind the scenes look at what really goes into managing our wonderful public land systems um, as, uh, as managed by the National Park Service. We have one question for you before we move on to Ashley and um, what made you want to work for the National Park Service? Do you have a favorite park or a favorite experience in a national park? Yeah, that's such a, a great question. I did not set out to work for the National Park Service. It's something I encountered along the way as I was um, you know, learning about career options like you all are right now. Um, but I do love the work that I do. And what I love the most is the applied nature of the data informing real-time decision-making of public land management. That's really important to me. My favorite park is Big Bend National Park. I have spent three 30-day expeditions there teaching wow. classes and guiding university students. And it's just an incredible experience. The, the desert environment there is incredibly spectacular. When you grow up in Pennsylvania, you're used to a certain environment and the desert is just so unique. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have a, a couple other questions that came in for you, but I wanna move on to Ashley and we should have time at the end to make sure that we address everybody's questions. So thank you so much, Rose. and. Um, and next up, if I can figure out how to run the slide, Ashley, is um, Ashley Mingle, who is a senior GIS analyst with Gannett Fleming. Yes, thank you so much. That was such a good presentation, Rose. It's so interesting. I think we kind of take the parks for granted. Sometimes we don't understand how much is going on behind the scenes with all the work that you guys do. So kind of switching sides. Um, uh, like Dr. Jan said, I, my name is Ashley Mangle. I'm a senior GIS analyst. Um, a lot of you are probably wondering even what GIS is, but hopefully I'll answer that question with this um, quick presentation. Um, so my goal kind of, I just want to give you like a background of kind of my journey to let you know how I got to where I am. Um, and then kind of some examples of the work that I do on a daily basis. Because like I said, a lot of people don't understand what GIS is and sometimes have never even heard of it. So if you head to the next slide, please. As a lot of you guys probably are, I was pretty much an average middle school, high school student, um, you know, really interested in my friends and field hockey, my family, movies, you know, all the things that normal middle school students are interested in. Um, and I didn't necessarily have a specific um, path that I knew that I wanted to go for my future. And I just wanna to touch on this a little bit because I think that there seems to be a lot of pressure for you to decide what you wanna do with your career and you're only in middle school. So those things will work themselves out as they have with me. 
So moving forward, um, I graduated from Cumberland Valley and then I decided to go to Shippensburg. Um, I was actually kind of thinking about going into elementary education and I wasn't quite sure. So I wanted to go undecided to Shippensburg. And then I thought once I was there, I would figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, so next slide, please. So a couple of, this seems like a very random slide, but these things are important to me. And I didn't actually realize how important they were when I had such great interests in them. So, you know, I loved the movies Twister, Dante's Peak. You guys probably haven't even seen those movies because they're pretty dated at this point. Um, but there's a couple other educational things that stuck out in my mind. And they didn't necessarily stick out at the time, but looking back at them, I realized how much they meant to me and how much I learned when I was um, in those types of classes. So the first one's the sedimentation box. I don't know if you guys have done those. I think I did those in about fifth grade, but for some reason, those always stuck out in my mind, even the water cycle or specifics in biology classes that I took. And even going into college, sure, I understood that, you know, I liked science. I was pretty good at it, but I didn't really understand that it was something that I could do as a career. I didn't really understand what I would do with it. Um, so heading to the next slide, I took some of the general education classes at Shippensburg and by golly, I found what I wanted to do. And you take some of those classes and you're just drawn to the information and you're just essentially a sponge and you just want to learn everything about it. So some of the classes that stuck out, stood out for me were soils classes and geology classes. And I took my favorite class, sorry, Dr. Dance, it was geology of national parks. So things like that really stuck out to me. And um, I ended up taking a GIS class, actually a couple of them, if you could head to the next slide. And so let's get into what GIS is. It's geographic information systems, if you have not heard of it. So what I like to describe it as is Google Earth, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with on steroids. Um, so it's just an amazing tool that you can gather, manage and analyze spatial data. And you kind of just think, oh, I'll look at a map, figure out where I am in the world, but you don't understand how many different layers you can put on top of that and what GIS can actually do for you. So if you head to the next slide, this is one of the best visuals that I can help describe what GIS is. So if you look at the bottom layer, that's the real world. And then you can add a whole bunch of different layers with information on top of that to essentially analyze and report and um, essentially tell a story and solve problems with all this data on top of each other. Um, if you click ahead, there's some great visuals and different maps that have been created. Um, so for instance, you can identify what location you are and understand what the air quality index is in your specific area. I don't know if you guys can read some of the specifics on that, but it's great. I mean, it, not only does it give you the air quality index, but it also tells you what the population is in that area. And there's a ton of data that you can add to try to analyze. If you click to the next slide, this was, um, I hate talking about COVID, um, but it's right there in the front. Um, this is one of the most used maps um, to essentially track uh, where COVID cases were starting. And I think um, Johns Hopkins actually developed it. But at the beginning, I remember, you know, me and all my GIS coworkers, uh, we were so intrigued by this because you could essentially see where the curves were, where the hotspots were, what countries were kind of taking on, but this was all done using GIS. So we head to the next slide. Um, so when I was in Shippensburg, I did a couple internships along my way, kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with it. Um, and then one thing when I was looking for a job that stood out on my resume was GIS. So that's what landed me to Gannett Fleming Engineering. Um, it's an engineering firm in Camp Hill. If you wanna head to the next slide. Um, so global infrastructure consulting firm and everybody's like, what is that? Well, essentially we solve problems, I would say. We're hired by the federal government, uh, local government, private business owners to help solve their problems. And specifically for the next slide, um, I'm in the environmental resources division in the dams and hydraulics GIS group. So it's kind of a mouthful, but if you start to click through some of these examples of what projects I specifically work on, um, I do flood mitigation studies. So if you need to figure out if you're in a floodplain or not, or if your property will be inundated, 
Um, another really um, prominent project that I work on is dam failure analyses. So there's dams, hundreds and thousands of dams across the United States. And we have to study if one were to, heaven forbid, fail, where is that flood wave of water that's behind the dam going to go? Um, so that's, those are things that you just don't think about and we use GIS to analyze all of those. Um, drone services, so drones are pretty big over the last few years. We'll use GIS with drones as well um, to analyze data. And then the last one, um, just a quick example, is just stormwater inventory and management. So you don't even notice those grates on the side of the road. Well, they have a certain amount of water that they're allowed, they are able to pass. So we map those and essentially analyze how much water can flow through those pipes. So moving on, um, I just want to quickly just go through one project example um, with you guys. Um, this was a study that we did in Frederick, Maryland. They had six inches of rain in a very short amount of time. Um, and they had a significant amount of flooding across their city. So we were actually hired by the Army Corps of Engineers and by the city to come in and say, okay, we know we have these flooding issues in these specific areas. Can you guys help us to come up with flood mitigation alternatives? So can you please tell us, in other words, can you please tell us what we can do to help alleviate this flooding? Um, so for the next slide, um, this is one of the problem areas that I have circled there on the left-hand side. Um, and essentially where you see those cars, that's the top of the road, that's West Patrick Street, as you can see. So a couple of feet of flooding, um, and this is a recurring theme. So they wanted to try to figure out how to alleviate this flooding. So we did a lot of GIS analysis and engineering studies to figure out how much water can go through the pipe that goes under the road. So if you go to the next slide, I think I have a photo of the pipe. Um, so that's the existing pipe. Um, you can see it's not very big. Um, so essentially we knew the issue would be pipe capacity, meaning it couldn't allow enough water to go through. So therefore the water would back up behind the road and then go across the road. So we did some field reconnaissance on the next slide um, using GIS and drones um, and some remote sensing. And then we came back into the office, did some more analysis with our GIS and engineering software. And essentially we determined what size culvert or pipe needed to be um, resized to, to allow that amount of water to go um, through the road or under the road and not over the road, if that makes sense. So if you go to the next slide. So if you look at the right-hand picture, um, the red is the old inundation area. So that's essentially what it looked like during a 10 year storm. And with us revising the pipe that goes under the water or under the road, we revised it to that yellow boundary. So that's what the revised floodplain boundary would look like. So I just, that was just a quick example. Um, and like I said, just try to hone in on some of your interests and as strange and unique as they might be, like my husband gives me such a hard time for liking these, you know, B-rated movies, but I just love them. And it makes sense as to why I was drawn to them just because I love uh, the science profession. So that's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, and uh, I, I do wanna say Ashley has been volunteering with the STEAM for as long as Dante's Peak has been out. Don't bait me, don't bait me. <laughs> And, um, and, and Gannett Fleming has been a big supporter of Esteem as well. So Debbie tells me that um, uh, Gannett Fleming is, uh, uh, has, has given us uh, funds to, that go out to the, for the goodie bags for all of the Esteem participants. So you have Ashley and her company to thank for your goodie bags. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I have, let's see, a couple of questions for you. Um, one question is, um, do you have a degree in engineering? And did you have much uh, educational background beyond your degree before you started working with Gannett Fleming? That's such a good question. And I'm glad you brought it up because I meant to cover it. Um, I'm very fortunate. My boss is actually um, an engineer by um, education. And so he was really big into water resources and he taught me everything that I know as far as the engineering side. Um, so yeah, I mean, my day is probably like a, it's almost a 75, 25 split with engineering and GIS. Um, so no, I don't have anything other than my geoenvironmental with GIS certificate degree. 
Um, but I was just so fortunate to have someone to mentor me and essentially teach me everything that he knows. So um, I could definitely go back to school and learn more, but I've just been fortunate enough to be surrounded by all these engineers who are willing to teach me everything. <laughs> <laughs> And, and one more quick question is we have a question from a, a junior GIS major here at SHIP. And uh, Drake says, what is the most important tip or advice you could give a GIS major today to be successful in their future career? Uh, GIS specifically is evolving so rapidly. So I would say the biggest thing that you can do is to stay abreast with the technology because I'm telling you what, it is changing like daily, <laughs> if not like, hourly. So I would say um, definitely keep up with everything that Esri is spitting out as far as their blogs and go to their conferences if you're able to. So I would say just keeping up with the technology since it's changing so much. That is uh, great advice. <laughs> it's tough to do. GIS. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we will, uh, we'll need to move on to, um, I think Sam is up next. Yes. So um, Sam is a recent, well, not, not too super recent graduate of Shippensburg um, and um, has now decided to, uh, to go into grad school. So, um, so let's hear from Sam. Thanks for coming, Sam. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give some background on me before I go into my slides, but I graduated from Shippensburg in 2019 with my Bachelor's of Science in Geoenvironmental Studies, a minor in GIS, and a certificate in sustainability. Um, during college and really throughout my whole life, I was active in the marching band, I played piano, um, I was on a dance team in college, so I was pretty active, and I just wanted to figure out like, what I liked and what activities that I enjoyed doing. Um, after I graduated college, I really I missed learning. I missed um, engaging with students and learning new things, so I decided to go to grad school. Um, I applied, applied to a bunch of them. Um, I guess I should talk about the application process. It's very similar to applying for um, undergrad college. I know you guys aren't really there yet, but um, you fill out their application with your basic information, your name, address, all that stuff. And then um, you ask for references. Um, a couple of my old professors and old bosses wrote me um, some really nice um, recommendation letters for college. And then you also have to write a statement of purpose, which details what you expect to gain out of the program, where you envision your life being like after you graduate and what career path you really wanna take and how you think that that program is gonna help you. And it, um, during college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I still don't really know, but um, I started at Chippensburg as a biology major and realized that the chemistry and the math was just too much for me. So my sophomore year, I switched my major to the geoenvironmental studies. And I really found a passion for that because my whole life I had been very interested in um, the environment and climate change and protecting species and all of the environmental stuff that was involved with the program. So I guess my advice for that would just be to find something that you're passionate about and stick with it. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So once I graduated college, I, like I said, I was just bored. Uh, I was working, um, but I, I did miss the learning aspect of it. So. I got into Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. I am currently pursuing a Master's of Applied Science in Spatial Analysis for Public Health. That's a mouthful, but it's a specialized program. Um, it is a 100% online. With master's programs, there's different kinds of, um, of schooling that you can go to. Um, you can do an in-person program. There's also hybrid programs where you would do half of the coursework 
online and half of it in person, or there's programs like mine where it is 100% online. Uh, I think the benefit of having it online is that I can work full time and still go to school. And this is completely 100% online, even with the pan even without the pandemic, we would still be online. So it's also really neat because I get to interact with students from all over the world. I have um, host students who are in like Thailand and Australia, India, China. So it's really interesting to get to know them and really make some friends in your online classes. Um, the way that the program is set up is it's two classes per term and it's 50.5 credits. So I am in my fourth term. So after May, I will be done with my first year and I'll have one year left. So it's a two year program. Um, some examples of classes that I've taken so far are biostatistics, intro to epidemiology, and spatial, spatial data technologies for mapping. Um, since, my, since my program is spatial analysis for public health, I use a lot of GIS, um, what Ashley was just talking about, and I use it in terms of public health standpoint. I map out diseases and um, just public health related topics, things that I didn't know were public health related topics actually. So it's, it's been a really interesting time. Um, next slide. Some possible future careers for somebody in my program are an epidemiologist, a public health researcher, a clinical researcher, I can go into healthcare management or healthcare administration, an environmental health officer. Um, I could go into cartography, could become a public health educator. I could be a geographic information specialist, similar to what Ashley does, or I could go into spatial statistics. Um, I really chose this program because I found a passion for like making maps. I really enjoyed the spatial analysis and GIS classes that I took at Shippensburg. And then um, my junior year, I believe, I took a medical geography class. And that class really opened my eyes to the public health mapping diseases field. So I, re I really wanted to find a program that I could map diseases. And I think that I found it. Um, next slide. Uh, so these are some examples of some coursework that I've done in my master's program. This is this is an area of Central California that we mapped, and I mapped the um, land use over this part of California. So you can see that it has the water, forest, land, rangeland, urban, barren, wetlands, and agricultural land. And this was for this was a this was a pretty big project. There was a lot of different labs that went into this. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this was another map of the same area. The same area um, we were investigating, or we were mapping an FDA investigation area on the E. coli outbreak in Central California. And this was. This was uh, the, the red dots on here are the, the positive locations. So e, e. coli um, in this instance, it developed on farmlands. And so these were mapping the different farms that had a positive test or negative test for E. coli on top of the land use cover. And so like, um, like Ashley said in her previous Slides, GIS can have a lot of different um, different layers. You can add a lot of things onto it. You can add all these land use classifications, the points, um, the scales, the the arrow bars, and the um, the subset of the image from the general picture of California to see exactly where this location is. Uh, I really learned a lot throughout these classes to build upon my previous GIS knowledge. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This is the terrestrial landscape 
of that same location. This you can do in GIS. Um, it's quite simple actually, but it does look really cool to put it all together and see the landscape and how hilly California is with all the mountains and then the ocean right there. Thought this was a pretty neat picture to include. Um, on the next slide, so through John Hopkins University, I have um, applied for an internship and I got it. So my internship is with the Greater Baybrook Alliance in Baltimore. It's paid, so that's really nice because it covers uh, one term of my tuition. And I am researching collective efficacy in Baltimore neighborhoods. Collective efficacy is really just the cohesiveness of neighbors and how willing they are to help each other in a situation. I will be, um, in, in the springtime, I will be going down to Baltimore and administering a survey. Um, we're just still deciding on whether we're gonna do it between door to door or over the phone, but over the internship progression, I have developed this survey and really like finalized it. So it's about 60 questions. Um, and once the, once all the data is collected, I will analyze it and then make a map of uh, some of the questions so we can see the spatial analysis kind of response to some of the questions. So the pictures here um, in October, I believe, um, I went down to Baltimore for a environmental cleanup around the neighborhoods of Baltimore. And on the right hand side, that is a Maryland state delegate and me. She was there, she was really campaigning and this was her project, but she partnered with our, um, the, our organization to help clean up the, the, the neighborhoods and interact with all the residents and really figure out like, this was a good, um, this was a good first step for my internship because I could really see how all the neighbors communicated with each other and if they were willing to help help us pick up trash and just how they got along with each other. We got to interact with a lot of different people, which was really neat. Um, next slide. So that is a map of the area of my internship and like where I will be surveying and conducting the survey in the springtime. I did not make this map, but um, I will make a map similar to this for once the data is collected to show where, where we collected the data. And um, you can see that it's broken down by the, um, the elementary school and the middle school and all the different symbols for the points. You can really see how GIS plays a big role in a lot of the, the mapping industry and my, and my uh, internship. I can go to the next slide. So I also work full time while I'm in grad school and on top of this internship, I am a 3D dermal tissue biologist at the Intro Institute for In Vitro Sciences in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, what, I, what we do, we're a nonprofit organization and we work for the, we're finding uses, finding alternatives to animal testing in cosmetic in the cosmetic industry. Um, so we, we do all non-animal testing methods, but I test um, for skin irritation and skin corrosivity. So we have tissues that are grown in a lab that are based on human cells and um, we test cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, agrochemicals, um, mouthwashes, toothpastes, really anything that you would come into contact with um, from like with your skin or your eyes or your mouth. And we also do um, a lot of internal like e-cigarette testing on your lungs and um, how that'll impact your liver and stuff like that. But um, it's the company. The company's mission is to improve animal welfare. So I think it's a it's a great company to work for. I'm really passionate about their 
their, um, their mission of ending animal testing. So we do a lot of presentations and a lot of conferences to really promote that, promote our goal and pr to promote that. But um, I work 40 to 50 hours per week. Um, oh yeah, and then the non-animal testing lab. Um, I test for irritation, toxicity, corrosive, corrosivity, and cytotoxicity of any test article that comes in. I also, on top of the lab work, write protocols for the sponsors, analyze, interpret the data, and write reports for the sponsor. So it's a really, it's a full circle kind of job. I started there as a technical writer, so I was only doing the reports and the protocols at first, and then I got I applied for an open biologist position and got it. Um, I do schoolwork for my grad program once I get home. And my company pays for tuition reimbursement. It's based on um, your grade performance at the end of the term. You, uh, at the end of the term, you'd send them your grades and you would get, I think you get half back for every A and then a quarter back for every B and then nothing in nothing reimbursed you for anything with a C or below. So it really makes you strive to get better grades and like do the work and really be engaged in the classes so then you can get the grades to get the tuition reimbursement. But um, I, so definitely something that I'm really passionate about. Like I said earlier, I still don't know what I wanna do. As you can imagine, this is nothing uh, geared towards my master's program in spatial analysis but I also really am enjoying the toxicology field. So maybe I wanna go into something with that later on, or maybe when I started the grad program, I wanted to combine my, my knowledge of my undergraduate in environmental sciences and with the spatial analysis part of the grad program to hopefully start mapping some environmental public health data. And um, right now, I'm not really sure if that's what I want to do anymore. So I might stick with the toxicology field. But I guess my, my advice to that is you, you might not know what you want to do, but just find something that you're passionate about and stick with it and make a career out of something that you love. Thank you, Sam. I am, uh, I am amazed at the breadth of your experience after college. I mean, you, um, you know, you started out as a technical writer and then a biologist and now public health. And so, I mean, when you're done with your public health degree, you're going to have um, so much experience. I think it's going to open up a lot of pathways. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do either. And, and so I think that that's, that's a good message for, um, for you all um, in, uh, in, in middle school that, you know, you don't have to know what you want to do, no matter um, if you're in middle school, high school, college, or grad school. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so thank you, Sam. And um, let's see, last but not least is uh, Caitlin Lucas. And we, uh, Caitlin didn't put any slides together, um, but we put together kind of a little resume of the time that she spent here at Shippensburg because um, we loved having her. So, um, so take it away, Caitlin. Hello, everyone. Yes, um, I did not do slides tonight um, because, you know, I just do a lot of slideshows in, in my world. And, and I thought for something like this, I just really want to connect with you guys. Um, and and talk to you as a as a person. So I hope we connect a little bit here and that you guys are learning some things. Um, so first, my title is really long. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and call myself a clean water coordinator. Uh, I'm currently at the Franklin County Conservation District. Um, we'll talk about my journey a little bit to how I got there. Um, so when I was, you know, much like Ashley had put up all the things she was interested in middle school. Um, I, as my parents liked to, to call it, was in too much, um, was, was interested in too much, did too many things. Um, I was in probably every club that my school offered except for two of them. Um, I, I just loved learning different things, doing different things, being involved with different people. Um, I was always that kid. I felt like, in my point of view, 
that I was kind of a part of every group, but I wasn't um, one of those main people in any of the groups. I just kind of, I hopped around to every activity. And um, one of those activities was um, Technology Student Association, which actually is like a STEM club. Um, a lot of schools have it, some don't. And what I used to do is, um, a middle, as a middle schooler, in addition to volleyball, dance, Girl Scouts, uh, math club, Spanish club, reading club, all the different clubs, um, I competed in engineering uh, competitions. So what I would do was, um, you know, there, there were different different events and, and we would pick a topic. And the one that I, I really loved competing in was uh, Formula One race cars. And they were, of course, model cars, not real race cars. Um, and that was when I learned in eighth grade, actually how to do 3D computer automated design, computer aided design CAD. Um, and I would design these 3D cars and then um, we would compete and we'd have to, a little timer would count down three, two, one. And, you know, you click your little button and the car would shoot off and whoever got the fastest time won the competition. But in addition to making the car, you know, for months on end before the competition, um, and then going to the competition and doing the race and clicking the button. I was the button clicker. We were on a team. Um, I, I would also have to, with my team, prepare a binder about, you know, our methodology and how we designed the car and why we did it that way and, and all these things, all this research. And then we would have to do an interview with a judge or with a panel of judges. Um, so anyways, that was just one thing that as a kid, like that was the one thing that really stuck out to me was like, oh, I'm going to do uh, some career in CAD, like, because I really loved art. I loved designing things, um, but I also was really good in math. And actually, I was awful in science. Um, I, I thought the only thing you could do with science was medical field, and that was not for me. I don't have the stomach for it. So um, I the lesson and the theme that you're going to see here is that there were many times I thought I knew what I wanted to do and, and every time I, I then proved myself wrong. And um, quickly I want to throw out another theme you'll see here is that through life you're going to feel like every single decision that you're going to make is so permanent and something I have learned in my few short years out of school um, is that while every decision does impact your life and your, and your path, um, nothing is like permanent, you know, like you're, you're allowed to make a wrong decision. So I'm just going to throw that out there and, and you'll see that as I go along the way. Um, so anyways, uh, after school, I ended up at Shippensburg. I actually went there to be a business major, uh, to be at, what I really wanted to be was a statistician, like, uh, Rose was talking about in, so then they told me, oh, hey, you're in the wrong department. You really should be in the math department. I said, oh, okay. So I switched my major before I even got there. Um, and I was in the math department for one semester. I said, oh, this is not it. This is not for me. Even though I really loved math, I just didn't love doing it full time apparently. Um, and and you know, that's another theme of mine, uh, doing one thing full time um, is not quite my thing. And so then I moved into art uh, because I wanted to be a sustainable designer. And I thought I'm going to be an interior designer, but I'm going to also take uh, environmental classes at the same time. So I'm going to get both things there. And I'm also going to take a business minor because I want to make sure I know how to run a business if I'm going to be a designer. So then I was taking business art and environmental science all at the same time. And, and the designer thing didn't work out just because of the way colleges and credits and ally programs work. And so that fell through and I said, well, you know what, this environmental stuff, this is actually really interesting. Something I didn't realize in my childhood was my family was always out bird watching, walk, taking hikes, riding bikes. We were always outside. I was a Girl Scout um, I, and that never stuck in my head. And, you know, my mom always preached recycling and, you know, never littering and, and taking care of the animals. And uh, I just I never really thought much about it. It was just how I grew up. So. Anyways, um, when I when I realized, oh, this environmental thing, this could be my full, this could be my full career. Like, oh yeah, let's go for that. So then I I get into geo environmental studies, and they tell me, hey, you know how you're going to get a job by getting a GIS certificate. So now at this point at Shippensburg, it's my junior year. I have to complete a major in two years. I have all these business and art credits that I don't want to go to waste. So 
I decided to turn those into minors and to complete them on time. I took summer and winter classes so that I could graduate on time. And, um, and then I also got my GIS certificate because I was told that's how you're going to get a job, having that geogra geographic information systems. And I, okay, okay, great. So then I did that <laughs> and I did graduate on time. And um, a part of graduating at Shippensburg for the geo department is that you have to take an internship. Well, um, there was an opportunity for me to possibly work with uh, Rose <laughs> down the line. Um, I could have worked for maybe the National Park Service because I had an opportunity for an internship there doing um, GIS and mapping at Harpers Ferry, the, the center of all of the National Park Service mapping. Uh, I might be incorrect about that, but that's kind of what I recall from that internship conversation. And, and I decided I wanted to go work with my friend up in Maine at a land trust because then I could get you know hands-on with water testing and all kinds of stuff. And Sure enough, up at the, the land trust up in Maine, they need a GIS mapping. So that's what I ended up doing. That GIS sure is valuable to everybody. Uh, so then that was what I did my internship with. And I had that GIS background. And at Shippensburg, I worked with Dr. Jantz and the Center for Land Use and a lot of the other professors there um, on energy mapping and stakeholder outreach. You can see in those photos, I'm sitting around a table with some maps and post-it notes and uh, we're in a big group there in Baltimore. This was at a stakeholder outreach event where, you know, we were talking to local people about um, all, all kinds of things uh, for community planning, you know, demographics, population, climate change, water, all of that. Um, and, and, and trying to get a community plan together for their future um, as the world changes. Um, so so I got that experience with them and I also got the energy mapping portion um, where I did GIS mapping of transmission lines that, that carry electricity and energy and, and gas pipelines and oil pipelines and solar energy and solar potential based on how the mountains are faced and how high they are and the different landscapes. And uh, so my first job actually hired me for that specific reason, little did I know at the time in the interview, they had been trying to break into the energy industry. Um, it was a private consulting, environmental consulting firm. Um, and so I thought I was headed down the academic world. And then by the time I got to senior year, taking all those extra classes, I was so burnt out. I thought, you know, I just really want to start a life and see, see what happens. And so that's what I did. I graduated. I, I got this job right out of college and I did that for about three years. And I really, really missed working with people. Uh, so, so then, um, Again, this is a theme with me. Uh, I loved GIS, but I liked using it as a tool, not full time. I, di I didn't want to do one thing all the time. And so then um, I, I had the opportunity to take this job where I got to interact with the community. I got to um, write papers and do research and work with budgets and funding and write grants and help out the community. And, and that was really what I wanted to do and, and help clean up water, both in our area. And then as you know, water connects, it all leads out to the ocean eventually like in Nemo. So, um, you know, I, I work to clean up local water quality, but it's also to help clean up the Chesapeake Bay and restore those ecosystems. And so that's where I'm at now. And um, my whole presentation here uh, is just to tell you that in my job now, I get to do a lot of things like um, revolving around clean water, like I just mentioned. And for me, the big one is that I wanna to pass to you is communication and, and how you talk to people and interact with people. And a huge part of my job is communication and, and that messaging and making, making sure that um, people feel the same way I do about clean water um, and, and that it's good and that everybody can benefit from it and that it's not about uh, you know, one water body and it's the Chesapeake Bay and it's not about the government regulation and, and them saying we have to do it. It's, it's about the fact that it's good for everybody and it's good for wildlife and it's good for nature and trees. And um, so basically I, I act as a liaison between the government and the community. And uh, so that's part of the reason I shortened my title to clean water coordinator. Nobody needs all, all that extra stuff. It's just confusing and, and regulatory. So um, Anyways, I, I take the really complicated policy legislation type stuff and, and I turn it into something that local people can connect to because in the end, this is all what, what I work on these, these 
uh, pollution reduction type goals for the state, um, it's all for the benefit of people and, um, and the environment and the environment that the people use, right? So um, I, I just figure out how to connect the people to the, those um, regulatory type conversations. And um, so as you heard my, my experience along the way, every choice I made, um, passing up the National Park Service internship, all of that, it, it all impacted my life um, in such a positive way. And, and every time I start to get bored and think, you know, I'm not um, doing enough um, academically, like to me, the, the best part about a, a job is learning it and learning the new stuff and, and learning about the topics. And now I know all kinds of things about farming. And let me tell you why I'm not a farmer, even though my jean jacket might say otherwise. Um, so that's, that's just my message today is that um, we learned so much along the way. And this is the, the job that I have right now, but my career is ever evolving and, and who knows where I'll be next. Um, especially because this particular job I have is, is a contract currently. And, and should they decide that they need me for more than three years, maybe I get to stay or, or maybe I go in another direction. So um, just stay open to, to all the opportunities that come your way because each choice will end up benefiting you in, in some way. Even if at the time you feel, you feel like, oh, maybe that was the wrong choice. Maybe I should have went the other way. Just, just always you know, know that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, but it sure can be. And um, yeah, just, um, just know that it's okay not to know. And uh, like Dr. Jan said, you know, we can be really far into our careers and, and, and not really ever had planned to be there. Like she, she didn't know what she wanted to do. And, and now she's a professor and she's impacting all of us and um, setting us up for, for great lives too. So Anyways, that's all for me. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm open to them. Great. Well, um, thank you all so, so much. Um, I think if we can get our panelists to um, open their videos, um, we do have a few minutes left for questions. And I would like to come back to Rose and bring her back into the conversation and kind of ask, you know, how you did you have, how did you end up in the Park Service? The Park Service is one of my like dream jobs. So did you start out right after you finished your PhD or did you, you know, have some other positions and then end up, end up there later on? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually started my job with the Park Service while I was finishing my PhD. So I was three and a half years in and with uh, federal agency jobs, uh, when they come available, if you're interested, you just, timing doesn't matter. You gotta apply because they don't come available all that often. And I had a good friend and a colleague that we now work together who had a PhD and we have a similar background from expedition guiding um, and other you know, programs we had worked on together. And she really helped me understand what the position was because that's part of it too. I think sometimes these job positions are not very clear about how you will use your skill set. So she helped put me in contact with the hiring manager who's also not listed oftentimes on job posting. So it's just very, you know, like getting in contact with people and just being willing to make the call. And I really loved, Caitlin, what you were saying, just be open to opportunities. I had no idea if I would like my job job with the park service I started as a term employee which was a renewable position for up to four years and during that time they listed a permanent position that I applied for and then since then have transitioned into project management so when I started I always thought you know what it's going to be no harm to me at all if I just give this a try and see if I like it what is the year of my life um, they can say no I can say no we can mutually walk away from this agreement this is a great opportunity to give things a try and when I realized how much I could use all of my collective education and experience that was when I was like this is such a cool job it is really a cool job I get to travel a lot the downside of traveling a lot is that you're traveling a lot so you know it's like pros and cons of that but in between all of my degrees I worked for two to three years so I was um you know got my 
math degree, worked for a couple years, got a master's, worked for a couple years, and then was working on a PhD, was managing research projects and teaching the, the typical research and teaching assistantships that are offered and that if you pursue grad school, you should definitely do. Sam gave some great examples of working really hard in your program while you're also studying, which can be a lot, but also be really valuable to your future career options. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take just a, a few more minutes and um, and Sam, you said during your presentation that there were examples of things you were learning that you didn't know were public health issues. And I wonder if you could just give one example of of something you learned that you were kind of surprised about or or you weren't aware that was really a public health issue that is. So um, my internship is centered around the violence that occurs in Baltimore. And so violence wasn't something that I would have considered public health at all, but it is. Yeah, that's wonderful. One thing that I really noticed from all of your presentations is that um, one of the things we uh, that kind of drive us in the geography or science department is that we want our students to be lifelong learners. and. All of you have been like, well, I was bored and I wanted to keep learning or I love to learn on the job or don't stop learning about GIS. And uh, and so that's that's really good to see that um, that come through. Um, we had one question that I think we'll close with and each of you can take a stab at this, but it, it's a really simple one is uh, because you are all obviously very busy and driven. What is a hobby that you enjoy outside of your job? <laughs> Caitlin, you've already put some thought into it. What do you got? Uh, well, I just wrote, you know, of course, with clean water, like I, I love kayaking. Uh, if you saw my little picture when my camera was off, that was on my favorite reservoir here in, in Caledonia. Um, and what, you know, I moved away for that first job and then ended up back here. And something I really missed was the nature. And so now that we're no longer in a condo and we, we get to have a yard, I have a big garden. I like to grow our own food. I think that's a really fun, cool thing to, to try to do with sustainability. And it keeps me busy and it keeps me outside and off the couch um, because the plants need me to survive. Um, and I don't even remember what all I wrote. I love so much. I love crafting. I, I do all kinds of different crafting, stained glass projects, painting. Um, I like to do a lot of DIY projects around the house, probably all of our wall decor. I probably made it just because I get bored that's a theme with me. I, get, I always want to be doing something different. And so, yeah, and I like to learn new things all the time. So I always want to be trying something new. That's how I stay busy. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, probably gonna be a common theme. I'm always out, outside essentially. So skiing in the winter time, uh, kayaking, hiking, backpacking, everything in the summer. Um, yeah, and I have two little kids, so they keep me pretty busy as well. <laughs> Rose? Yeah, great. I love the theme here. I am what I call an opportunistic recreationist. I like to take advantage of whatever's happening around me at that time. And so, you know, a few weekends ago, uh, my husband and I rented an uh, off-road vehicle and we went and did some off-roading in the snow up in the Forest Service behind um, where we live. And it was awesome. We'd never done it before. We just thought it'd be fun. So we did that. And then I also love reading and eating. I love eating different foods, just trying um, different cuisines. And yeah. I also love to eat. <laughs> and Sam, I know you have a new puppy, so that's probably taking up some time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just got the new puppy. She's great. So she, um, we do, I take a, a lot of my time goes to her, but uh, I'm looking forward to taking her on hikes and um, I, I really like swimming and being in the water, going to the beach, um, reading at the beach and definitely like Rose said, trying new cuisines and new restaurants and um, different places. <laughs> Great. Well, um, we we're we're at five minutes after eight, so um, I know it's getting close to bedtime for me. So, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it was so wonderful to have um, you all. Thank you so much for your time and. 
Um, thanks to everyone who attended. I hope that you, um, you know, learned some things, were inspired by, um, by these women who are obviously, you know, doing a little bit of everything and, uh, and, uh, and, and inspiring um, uh, people around them. And so, um, so yeah, so thank you all for coming and thank you for um, joining us, everyone. And please, you know, feel free to reach out if, um, if you'd like to be connected um, to any of these, these women, um, or if you want to talk more about Shippensburg University, uh, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, so yeah, so we hope to hear from some of you and, um, and thanks again. Um, and I guess we'll call it an evening. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Bye, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.